Hey everyone, this is a long overdue bike build. I got this a while ago from Monkey Shred or Mark over in the UK. He sent it over, I think this time last year or early last year. It's an old Saracen Conquest. They're made with Reynolds 531 tubing, which is quite a nice tubing set. This one is pretty beaten up and it's too big for Mark anyway. So I ended up getting it. So they do have a 531 Reynolds fork as well. Unfortunately, the fork got damaged in transit, so one of the brake bosses came out of its post. But that was a pretty easy fix, just by someone rebrazing it back in. So Mark coated the frame with rust converter, because there's just surface rust all over it. Surprisingly, it actually looks in pretty good condition internally. I've seen way worse than this. This is just a little bit of staining. He sent it over with the original Tangelovin headset as well. That's quite a nice little touch. So it has head tube patches on the head tube as well as the seat tube. For some reason it's the same um, decal that they went with. One of the first issues with the bike, apart from the brake boss, is that the seat tube has a bit of a lip here. So I noticed that when I put in the seat post first and went to adjust it that it was sort of marring up the seat post. After that I went about trying to find out which is going to be the best way to strip the bike down to paint it. I could leave it as like a bit of a rat bike but I thought in the long run I'm just going to end up rebuilding it and repainting it anyway. So I thought I'd just skip to the restoration part. So this is some paint stripper and then just scraping it off just to see how easy it comes off. I think the paint is quite thin so um, some paint stripper would be a pretty good way to, to strip the whole bike. Then just trying out some sandpaper as well. But I end up doing quite a lot of it with just a wire brush attached to the drill. Um, you can just take it to a sand blaster or a meteor blaster or something like that. But yeah, this is it after some wire brushing. So you can see it still has some rust on there, so it needs like a little bit more time. But the top tube and the seat tube was pretty much the worst of the rust. It's funny how it sort of always seems to affect like the top of the tube but not the bottom of it and the bottom racket shell and stuff was in pretty good condition they're just stripping off the decals now i did have some decals already ordered so i could just scratch all this off you can see there there's some rust under the paint i think this happens by painting in like humid conditions and i guess sometimes when there's like a paint chip or something like that the rust can sort of start to form under the paint and then it can just spread from there. So the bigger portions, like the long straight tubes and stuff, it was probably fastest to just sand the paint off. But in some of the nooks and crannies and things, the wire brush was the fastest option. Just because like, some of the intricacies and stuff, just the wire brush gets in there so much easier. And then on the back sides of the brake bosses and stuff, I used paint stripper to get in there. So there was a couple of little rust pittings in some little parts, like here. You can see here on this um, C tube cluster. So I just got the wire brush in there the best I could, and then um, rust converted some spots. Was, like I said earlier, it was just mostly the top tube and the seat tube. After that, just cleaning off the frame and getting it ready for paint. You really want to get the primer on as fast as you can after stripping the frame because it'll start flash rusting and especially if you're painting in like humid conditions and stuff, you really don't want to leave the frame raw. So just putting on the edge primer now, just trying to get a nice even coat before it starts rusting away. After that, just making sure that the primer coat is nice and smooth. And then testing out the top coat. So this wasn't quite as dark as I was hoping. It's supposed to be sort of close to a plum color. So I ended up using black as the undercoat for the top coat. And that came out quite a bit nicer. Just checking it outside, and cat checking it out. And so this is the color. In some of the clips, it will look a bit more pink, but this is pretty much how my eye sees it. 
and I wanted this detail here on the head tube, but for some reason the paint wrinkled. It's the same paint as the plum color as well, so I don't understand why it did that, but who knows. So I just stripped it down and then like recoated it again. After that it came out quite nice. As well as the that head tube detail, I wanted some lug lining. This is the first time doing it, so I bought one of these pens because I've heard really good things about them. Just testing out some paint now and thinning down the paint just a little bit, just so it flows a little bit faster. This was actually pretty easy, first time doing it, uh, but yeah, pretty happy with it. If the lugs or the lining in there does have like a little rough spot, it does make it a little bit harder, but you can just go back so and So these are the decals I got from H. Lloyd Cycles in the UK. I'm just going to apply them with some water. These aren't water slide decals, but using water to put decals on it just makes it so much easier. You can position them nicely and then you don't get any wrinkles or anything under them. So basically you just want, um, for most decals anyway, you want like a drop of dishwashing detergent or something that doesn't have any oil in it. Um, something similar to that in the water and then just spray a bit on and then position the decal and everything and then get something like an old card or whatever to squeegee it out then once it squeegees out quite a bit you'll feel it sort of to start to stick um, it just makes makes it so much easier and especially with bigger decals and stuff um, you won't get wrinkles or bubbles or anything like that then after some time you want to peel off the transfer paper. Just do this slowly and make sure that the letters aren't coming off with the paper. Uh, but if one does come off, just take your time and sort of position it back. <laughs> after getting them in the right spot, I try and go over it again just to make sure that it gets most of the water out and stuff. You will need to give it some time before clear coating oh, over it. Um, oh, I don't know if I mentioned, but I did put clear coat between <laughs> the top coat of paint and the decals, just because the paint that I was using was sort of uh, matte or satin. So if you are going to use some matte or satin paint, um, it helps to use the clear coat in between, just because then it sort of levels out the paint and helps the decals stick a bit better. Uh, but if you're just using gloss coat, it's not really necessary. You certainly do want to test out the clear coat with your decals before. So if you've got like an extra one, I normally get an extra just to test it with a particular clear coat that I'm using. Because some clear coats can make the decals bleed or run or just do all kinds of crazy stuff. So it pays to get a spare one. And then just put that on like a test frame or test spot somewhere. I really like this decal. Like the details and everything in it look really nice. And same as the head tube and seat tube badges. That are really cool. So once the fork was all done, I put some more coats of clear on. I think I did three in total. But you've got to let it dry in between coats. But it came up quite nice after those three coats. So I did want these dropouts to be raw again. Um, there's a few ways to do it. I didn't have the, the sanding attachment for the Dremel, um, like the flat sanding, but so I just used this little Y brush. Just because they're quite nice old sun tour dropouts, so I wanted them to be raw. Actually thinking about it, I could have filled in the letters with like a different color as well, um, but I didn't. So after just Y brushing those, I just gave them like a quick sand and clean and then like a gentle polish. There are like nickel plating and chrome plating kits that you can use on dropouts and stuff. So that'll be fun to try out sometime, but um, I didn't do that this time. Just gave it like a, a raw look, I guess you'd say. So after those last minute details, it was finally time to put the bike back up. I just cleaned up the factory headset just with some auto sole and stuff and then re-greased everything and put it back together. 
This is just the DIY headset press. It's basically just threaded rod with some washers and a couple of nuts and stuff. It works pretty good. You just have to be careful that it goes in straight. Uh, but I haven't cracked a head tube open with it so far. Touch wood, so we'll see how it goes. But I've installed a bunch of headset cups with it so far. Nice fresh grease in the bearings. It does feel pretty good, but I would like to replace it at some point. But that would just be purely cosmetic. Um, it feels pretty nice, so there's really no need to replace it. Um, I did tidy it up and put some Penetrol on the outside of it just to clean it and sort of prevent it from rusting in the future, but yeah, replacing it at some point would be nice. So just putting some grease in the stereo tube now and putting on the handlebar. And we're going to be using a Nitto Bulmos handlebar. So they do make these in the cool version as well. Um, but we're going to be using the B903, which is the threadless version. And we're going to be using that with a quill adapter. There's a couple of reasons why I went this route. Um, a, this version is actually cheaper to buy outright in the first, way, in the first place. Um, B, the shipping was cheaper from Blue Lug in Japan. Um, it actually worked out quite a bit cheaper to get this version. Um, so we will have to use some spaces or like a bell or something to cover up that quill adapter. But it's not really a big deal. Um, I do have some spaces which look a bit nicer because this is quite a, a skinny outside diameter because it's a chromolo stem. Um, with the Bulmos section, um, you will need sort of some, some spaces to accommodate that. To shim it up, I'm going to just be using some old, <laughs> it's actually a Panaracer Gravel King, uh, like, packaging. I guess you call it, like, the ID card for the tires. I'm just going to be using those to shim it up. Um, because there's no load on here, it, it's really just to hold it in place. Um, I also chose these because then I can use them on other bikes if I wanted to. Um, just in case they don't work out on the spike or whatever. I have heard that the Bulmo spars aren't comfortable long term because you can't change the angle of them. So they don't work out for everyone. So they might not suit this bike in particular. Moving on to the shifters now. Got these really cool Suntour thummies. So we're not going to be using a full group set of the Shimano Deerhead that comes stock on this bike. Um, I prefer these shifters. I've really wanted to try them out. They just look so beautiful. They come with like these cool pedestals. And so you can sort of adjust how the thummy sits on the handlebar. Because the pedestal has like three different holes in them. So like the thummy, the shifter section sort of comes separate from that little pedestal or mount. So you can see here, I take them apart and then you can see this little mount. So that's how you attach them to the handlebar. This is just like a little band and then you adjust that nut and that tightens the mount onto the bar. So you can see there's the three different mounting um, pins or mounting holes that the little dowel sort of sits in and you can adjust the angle. So I guess with back swept handlebars or like different swept handlebars and hand sizes and stuff, using them in different positions can really help. I just set them up in the middle just to see how they're going to feel on this bar and then go from there. It's quite a cool ratcheting system. It just sounds really nice when you're shifting them. Um, it just helps prevent uh, like a ghost shift, I guess you'd say. So I just drop like a little bit of oil in there just to keep everything all lubricated nicely and prevent some rust and stuff, crud. The only thing is, if you do put oil in there, then it can sort of attract dust and grime and stuff as well. So just use it like a nice light oil. Mounting the shifter now. So like I said earlier, I just put them in like that middle position just to see how it's going to sit. I'm testing it out real quick. It's a beautiful shifter. The deer head shifters are pretty cool as well, but they're a bit chunkier and they're really hard to find and pretty expensive when you do find them. That I just couldn't justify it. Moving on to the brake levers. 
I have a few sets of these sitting around. They're four finger old Shimano Dior. I think these silver ones are uh, MT60 and the black ones are M730s. So I had some in black and some in silver, but the ones that I had that were silver, the body of it is <laughs> quite faded. So I needed to clean them up and repaint them, but then that wouldn't match. So I'd have to do both levers at the same time. So just stripping them down, just giving them like a quick cleanup and then painting them. I didn't know whether I should do this barrel adjuster as well, because I thought it would look a little bit weird if it's the exact same black. So I thought I would just leave it that sort of color that it is at the moment. Could probably strip it as well, like with some oven cleaner or something like that, and give it like a quick clean up so it would be silver, but I just don't know how it would look. I might do that next time, I think. So just using some etch primer and then some satin black after the after that. I just gave the lever blades a quick wipe with Autosol. After polishing up the levers, you really want to go over with some um, isopropyl alcohol or something like that, just to make sure you get all the polishing compound and stuff off, because otherwise you'll just end up with black fingers when you go to use the brake levers. <laughs> so cleaning those up and then going to reassemble them back together. Quite a simple process really. These levers were in pretty good condition, they didn't have too much slop or anything like that. So sometimes they get too much play in the lever blade and you'll have to add like some extra washers or get some new um, shims for them. The only thing is these bolts were a little bit scungy looking. So a quick way to clean up some bolts is to just put the bolt in a drill and then put it up against a rag or something with some auto sole. Or you can use like a scotch bite pad, like the metal finishing pads. That'll clean them up quite nicely and the autosol actually works pretty good to prevent rust and oxidization in the future. So I think sometime I'll try out some oven cleaner and then clean these up. You can just replace them. I do have some gold ones sitting around, but I don't think they'd suit this build. So I normally just keep some different barrel adjusters and stuff from other parts bikes and stuff. But I think these look pretty good, so we're going to just run that. The grips we're going to be using, I bought these from Blue Lug in Japan when I bought the handlebars. These are sort of a foam cork sort of style. I quite like foam grips. Um, the only real downside is they can sort of break and stuff quite easily. So if you lean them up against something. Yeah, I forgot to put the cable hanger in there. Um, so I'm looking forward to trying these grips. I have tried quite a few foam grips and I quite like most of them. Some of them are a bit too squishy. So the, f the firm ones are quite nice because then they sort of soften up with a bit of use. Didn't know how the shape was going to go with these because they do have like a closed off one end and then just a hole in the other end. So in my head I thought that the fat part should go at the outer edge. Um, but after looking at some other different ones, it makes sense, sort of. The brakes we're going to be using are some Shimano Deerhead ones. So I've had these off another bike that I got, like the derailers and stuff as well. Off, it was an old Shogun, Shogun 2000 I think it was. It's quite a nice frame set, but the frame itself is quite corroded and stuff. So I'm going to be building it up at some point. But I can't use these brakes on it because I'm doing like a 700c swap. So they don't angle quite down far enough. One of the downsides with these brakes are they don't have adjustable springs, so if you're going to need different spring tension to adjust them side to side, you're just going to have to bend the springs. The bolts, I couldn't find the tidy ones that I had, and the ones that came in the fork from Mark were a bit scungy. <laughs> I, could have, I could have used some evaporust or something to clean them up, but they had like a bit of pitting and stuff, so they wouldn't have looked too great. After recording the video though, I did find the other bolts, so I'll put those in. The cranks we're going to be using on it as well. These aren't, obviously these aren't Shimano deerhead ones. 
These are Sugino Super Maxis. I've had these sitting in my parts drawer for quite a while, but I haven't used them on anything. So they're 28, 38, 48 chain rings, and they're 180 millimeters long. They just need some new bolts. I bought these from Velo Orange in the States, but they are for double chain sets. So these Super Maxis are 50.4 BCD, like the other French equivalents and stuff, but because they're Japanese, they just use a regular Shimano crank removal tool, so they don't have that weird French oversized one. So a bit more standard, and I just really like the look of them. So just testing out the bolts and stuff that the Velo Orange kit came with. So it did come with some washers as well, but the washers, these are the factory ones that came, or these are the ones that came with the Super Maxis, I don't know if they're the factory ones. The one on my right hand here is the one that came in the kit, and it's not quite the same size as either of them. So I think I'll just be using the bolts. Some of the bolts were similar to the ones that came in the cranks, so they should work. Just testing them out here, and it looks like they're going to reach with not being too long, not too short, so I can replace those. They do look a little bit different, but um, they're much better, and I'm mainly replacing them just because the heads, the Allen heads and the bolts were a little bit rounded or close to rounding out, so I really don't want to get them stuck in there and then have to cut them out. Cleaning up the cranks with a bit of auto sole here. I think I went over one of them with a scotch pipe pad, it's just like a 3M finishing pad. I think I used the, the gray one just to clean it up a bit because it had some oxidizing on it. And slipping the chain rings back on. I messed this up the first round and put the bolts in the wrong spot. So you gotta make sure that you put them in the right position otherwise you'll try and bolt the, the next chain ring on and you just won't be able to put the bolt through. So you can see here, they're sort of offset in a certain way. Really like these cranks, so cool looking. Just before putting them on, I made sure that I could just use my regular crank puller tool. So I don't want to put the cranks on and then find out that I need a special tool to take them off. It came out really nice. I didn't want to polish up the chain rings or anything like that. It's just a whole lot of effort for something that's going to get covered in grease or chain lube anyway. Um, you can clean up the, the faces not too difficultly. But, you know, with the teeth and everything, it's just uh, it's a whole big thing. I don't want to have to go through all that. So the first bottom bracket I tried with this frame, I think it was 121 millimeters. It was a little bit too short. The bolts here were just catching a little bit. And I didn't have a 125 or like a 127 millimeter bottom bracket. So I just tried this 123.5 and that was just enough to clear. I think if there's a little bit too much flex I'll have to get something wider. But um, for now this will do just nicely. I wanted to go with these bear trap pedals just because I really like the style of them. It just screams like old mountain bike to me. Just using the Wago ones. I do actually have some of the Sun Tour pedals now. I picked up a Univega, a Univega Alpina or Alpina. Um, it's got Alpina Duo Uno. Um, I don't know. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's got some really nice parts on it. I'll be doing that in a future video. So these are the Shimano Deerhead derailers that I have. These are like pre-XT, I guess you'd say, what people call them. Pretty cool group set. Really cool looking, nice and reliable. Pretty unique with like these little stags on them. They fetch a decent amount of money, like on eBay and stuff. Just quite cool old Shimano mountain stuff. Um, I didn't have the thumb shifters, but the bike that, it, that they came on was off like an old touring bike. The wheels I'm going to be using on the bike are actually off the old Panasonic that I used to have. So just a nice running Sanson hub setup 
with some array of rims that are polished. This pretty nice sounding DNP freewheel. So it's just a six speed setup. But it runs nicely and I know that it works with a new chain. So the wheels I polished previously in the Panasonic video. But they just need like a bit of a cleanup. So I just flossed them like with autosol, you know, with like a rag flossing between the spokes. Tires we're using some Panarasa ridge lines. This is the first time using these. Bought these from Blue Lug in Japan. Pretty good price as well. Have this nice center ridge, so they should be pretty good on the road as well as off-road. And they came with this really cool instruction set. I quite like old Japanese stuff, so I think this would be a cool piece like to hang on the wall or something like that. Probably over here by the tools and stuff. As you can see, I, I do really like the, the Japanese style and the culture and stuff. So I do have this blue leg. <laughs> um, it's, the, it's the packing tape. They sold it for a little while on their site. I have that around my workbench. So just popping on the tires and then the rear wheel now. These are the valve caps that I have. I might put these up for sale at some point. I just need to get some more made. They're laser etched. So you can just write whatever you want. And I've had a few of these sets made up, but I just keep them like for my personal bikes and stuff. Brakes, we're going to be using cool stop Eagle pads and Box 1 cables. These are a linear compressionless cable, so they work really well with brakes. <laughs> with brakes, with um, rim brakes and, you know, cable brakes. They just feel nice. They don't compress and flex and stuff, so you get a really nice lever feel. Some people say that the Eagle brake pads have a little bit more give in them, so they're a little bit too soft, but I haven't had that in my experience. Um, for some reason, the supplier didn't have the salmon compound ones, which is what I normally go for, so I just got the black ones. They'll do for now. Setting out the brakes, you just want to rough in the pads and the alignment first, and then go for the shuttle cable, try and get that close to 90 degrees. On quite a few of these old Shimano brakes, there's like this little adjustment that changes the toe. You can see that there, that I was wiggling around. They're trying to get the toe adjustment right. Um, after that, I realized that I put the brake cable on the wrong side. So in New Zealand, you set up the front brake cable to the right lever, but I normally change it so my right hand does the rear brake. So I just changed that over, now setting up the rear brake threading the cable in through the cable guides and stuff. Um, I just like it that way because I'm right-handed and I think that works better for like wheelies and stuff, just give you more control. One thing that I sort of ran into an issue with was the cable stop or the brake ferrule. It wasn't quite the right diameter and I didn't want to run a linear cable straight into the cable stop without like a, a brake ferrule. So the Jaguar one seems to work really good just a slightly thinner diameter. I suppose if I had like a 90 degree drill, I probably could have cleaned it up and it would have fit nicely, but I didn't want to go through that and end up getting a ferrule stuck in there. The rear straddle cable, I went with a gear cable instead, and you can use like these little adjustment knobs, or I can't remember what the technical name for them is, but it's just like a little adapter thing so that you can run a gear cable in as a straddle cable. There's a couple of write-ups about how the gear cable is a little bit more flexible because it's um, thinner. I guess really it would be less reliable because it's thinner, so it's, it's not going to last as long. It's just going to snap <laughs> at some point, but I ran a few of them and it works pretty good. One thing I don't really like about the cable guys in this frame is that the inner cable goes over the Saracen decals. So just a small little detail, but I just don't know why they did it, and they should have just done it um, like further underneath the down tube, but I guess it's a little bit more protected from mud. Setting up the rear cable now. Pretty easy to do, especially when running friction. So these shifters don't have uh, indexing at all. It's, it's kind of like a micro indexing, sort of, because one way with the shifter has the ratchet, then the other way is just full friction. So you can sort of not count the distance, but like after you've used the shifters a few times, 
your sort of memory remembers how far or how many clicks there are to the next gear. It's kind of strange. One other issue that I ran into was this cable guide under the bottom bracket had a bit of corrosion in it and the cable wasn't going through. So I just used a spoke to sort of clear it out. Just, um, yeah, filed the end of a spoke and sort of reamed it in there a bit. Putting the chain on now. I like these SRAM ones because they do have a quick link. The newer Shimano ones, they just have that pin, which is kind of stupid because then you can't take the chain off. Just cleaning off that anti-rust coating that they put on, that really thick, sticky grease. I use some isopropyl or like kerosene or you know diesel, just anything to clean that off. WD-40. I'm popping on the quick link. Checking that the gears are going to work. We'll find that the limit screws are adjusted properly. That's pretty much it. I went over and double checked the brakes and everything. And then for the seat, I just popped on a Brooks B17 black one. I did notice some gear noise. I think the spaces are around the wrong way or there's the wrong spaces in here. So the chain is sort of heading on the second gear when it's in first and up in like fifth and sixth on the back. So I'm going to have to change that at some point, but it'll be fine for the test ride. And yeah, all done. I took this out to Ambry Farm for a bit of a gravel ride and I could get it muddy as well if I wanted to. You'll probably see the bike sort of change colour in some of these clips. Um, it'll, it'll definitely look pink in some of them and then in others it'll look a little bit darker. I think this clip is pretty similar to how it looks in person.
yeah, that's a nice puddle. Sometimes this gets really deep and it goes pretty much halfway up the wheel. This isn't too bad though, so... I'll go around the corner and have a look. But normally by this gate that's coming up, there's like a big, huge puddle when there's been a lot of rain and stuff. So if we can get through it, then we'll go up the hill. If not, we got to turn back. steps into it and it's submerged my feet completely. I should just sit on the grass like an idiot. Okay, I'll throw this over, see what happens. Actually we might as well just step over the perks of being tall. A little squish but not too bad. Not a cow shit, and the rim is <laughs> submerged in mud and cow shit. And once we get through this, this should be rideable. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I swallowed up the whole rim pretty much. Yeah, it goes up to a gate. Oh. I think we'll just do a little hiker bike. Oh, this might be the fence. Yeah, there we go. The fence. Doom bar shirt. Kind of looks like I'm wearing a bra. <laughs> That's sort of perfectly 
grasping it to my bosom. So once we get through that gate, you can sort of see some light trails. Uh, they sort of zigzag all over the place. Uh, the Bilmos bars, actually really happy with them. It's only been a short ride, so it's sort of hard to see how they're gonna be long term and on longer rides. But initial thoughts, uh, I like them. It would be nicer if they were tilted up a little bit more, but because they're fixed and everything, you can't change the angle of them. That's pretty much all of the riding I did. It was pretty hard to wheelie the bike. Uh, I did get like a couple of pedal rotations on it, which I was pretty happy with. It does really good skids. Um, the bike overall is pretty comfortable. The bull moose bars were good for me on this bike. Although this ride wasn't that long, so who knows what they're going to be like <laughs> in the longer ones. The fork does have like a little bit of flex to it, which is quite nice, so it soaks up some of the bumps and that. And the bike handles really planted. It doesn't feel super heavy and the steering doesn't flop or anything. It feels sort of in between like an 80s mountain bike and a typical 90s one. It's definitely not as agile or anything as some of the early um, 90s geometry, but it feels a lot better than most of the 80s stuff I've rode. It was really good. So overall, really happy with how the bike turned out. I really like the colour, especially how it looks a bit more pink in some of the lighting. Yeah, looks really good. The tyres actually roll pretty well as well. I didn't know if they're going to have too much off-road traction, which they don't really, but they are like a nice compromise of like a decent, cool-looking old semi-slope. So yeah, good job. <laughs> One thing I did forget to do was put on the... Nico Cycles reflector that Monkey Shred gave me. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. But these are custom reflectors by Nico Cycles. You can check them out on Instagram. This is the bike all covered in mud afterwards. It definitely needs a good clean up. Yeah, that's all I have for today. Thanks for checking out the video. Let me know what you think in the comments. The next bike that I'm going to be doing is a Cannondale Hooligan. So I'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye.